I want to share with you something out of the profound words of Jesus as we continue in the chapter 15 of Matthew. So you want to go to the book of Matthew with me. And in chapter 15, we left off in verse number 20, if you remember. But tonight I want to talk to you about something that's really important. The look of great faith. Let me say it again. Profound words of Jesus, and this is really subtitled, The Look of Great Faith. Jesus talks about great faith just two times in Scripture. He talks about faith a lot. Your faith has done this, your faith has done that. Be it unto you according to your faith. But here we find Jesus mentions only two times in scripture about great faith. One time is both, actually the one illustration is in Matthew, the 10th chapter, I believe it is, in verse number nine, and in Luke, the, I think it's the seventh chapter, verse number 10 or something like that, or ninth chapter, verse number 10. But it's all about the centurion. The centurion, if you remember the story, said, I believe in your authority. Don't give a flip about anything else. Just say what you need to say. You don't have to come to my house. You don't have to do a song and dance. You're God Almighty and my servant will be healed. And Jesus looked and he marveled at him and he said, I have found such great faith. No, not in Israel. Two times and the second time that he talks about great faith. And the reason I'm saying this is because you need great faith for the future especially after what's going on with Israel right now. And you need to pray for Israel right now. I mean, this administration that's in there right now has lost their minds if they're gonna turn their back on Israel because when you turn your back on Israel, you've turned your back on God. Whether you like Israel, don't like, or deal with their policies or don't agree with their policy, let me tell you something, don't go against Israel. You will go against God Almighty. That is the apple of his eye. And if you don't like what I just said, can I say something to you? Too bad. It's truth and it's in the word of God. So listen to what I'm gonna say to you. We find this, Jesus only marveled at two people in the Bible. He marveled at those that had faith and then he marveled at those, the Israelites that had no faith, that didn't have any faith at all. Here was God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and earth standing in front of them and they would not believe even though they saw and heard the signs of God. Some of you that are in here tonight, you're just like Israel you will hear and hear of and you will even see and maybe even experience the signs and miracles of God and your faith will never change. And tonight, listen to me, you need to have and learn how what the look of great faith is all about because you're gonna need great faith in the future. Not just faith. There's a difference between faith or great faith. And that's what I wanna look at tonight. Remember when we left off in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse number 20, Jesus makes a profound statement. He says to his disciples, it's not what goes in a man's stomach that defiles him. It's what comes out of the mouth. Remember that from last week? And we talked about that extensively. And I really felt like that was a great awakening for a lot of people that are in here. But here in verse number 21, the subject starts to get changed a bit because Jesus all of a sudden leaves that area and goes to a different area. Here's how this is gonna work for your understanding today. Let's, let's, let, me, let me explain it to you. I'm gonna read you about eight verses. Then I'm gonna come back and explain to you what takes place so that Jesus would make a statement about this woman's great faith. Is that okay? And then therefore, now listen to what I'm going to say to you also. What's written in the Bible is not written in the Bible for you to have just a little love boat captain idea about things. Not for you just to have a little story so you can understand, quote the scriptures and the stories to your children. What's written in the Bible is written in the Bible as an inspiration to you as to how God wants you to deal with your life. As long as you're living here, this is the key to understanding your future by understanding what the Bible has to say and then applying it in your life. 
The Bible, remember this, for some of you that are new and for those of you that have heard this a million times from Pastor Jim, you'll hear it now again a million and one times. It is, refers to itself, the Bible refers to itself as the hidden mysteries of God. They are hard to find and they are hard to figure out. That's why when you read your Bible and you go through all this, all this, you go, I don't know what's being said here. I don't understand that. It's hard to figure out. But when you find these hidden mysteries of God and you figure them out and you apply them in your home, your marriage, your finances, your dream, your vision, your school, your education, your job, every area of your life, my goodness sakes alive, you are now walking in the freedom that Jesus went to the cross to pay for while you're here on the planet. So your call tonight, you can be brain dead and just stare at me and be stupid when you walk out of here and get nothing, or you can listen to these words that are the inspired word of God. By the way, there's only two things that are eternal. It's the word of God, two things that are eternal. Number one, the word of God. Number two, the soul of man. So... If you want your eternal soul to be doing the right thing, ending up in the right place for eternity, listen closely tonight. Is that okay? All right, so let's take a look at verse, if you will, 21 and 15, chapter of Matthew. Let me read it to you. Remember, we're going to come all the way back and finish up. This is a cool little story. Then Jesus went out. Remember, he told his disciples, man, it's not what goes in their man's mouth. It's not because they defile anything because they wash their hands or don't wash their hands. And Jesus went out from there and he departed to the region of Syria and, and Sidon. And behold, a woman from Canaan came from the region and cried out to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not. A word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent to except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good for me to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is not just a story about how great Jesus is. It's a story about your future. And so many people don't understand that. This is a story, let me say it again, about your future. You will need great faith to accomplish the great things that are in your heart that God placed there. Let's take a look at this because this is pretty fascinating to me. Here's Jesus, he's entering a new region and a woman comes to him and this woman is not a Jewish woman at all. She's not from Israel. She's someone, if you will, that the Jews would not have any part of. She would be called a pagan. She would be called ungodly. She'd be called unclean. And she comes to Jesus in verse, if you will, verse number 22, and behold, and I love this word in verse 22, and behold. In other words, look and see. When you see the word behold in the Bible, for all of us that are in here, he's not just saying behold like, you know, some statement. He's making a statement to you and I, stop Look and see, here is something you need to get a hold of. And that word, behold, all of a sudden, bang, ought to jump off the page and tell you immediately to stop and consider what's being said. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him. This woman should not even be talking to him and she knows it. This woman is not accepted to be talked to him and she knows it. 
This woman can't get near him and she knows it. And he's gonna probably not have anything to do with her because the Jews didn't have anything to do with those kind of heathen people. And she knows it. And she comes and she doesn't stay quiet. Let me tell you something about great faith. Great faith has a great mouth. There in any way you're gonna stay quiet and get what you want from God. There in any way you're gonna sit back and see, well, if God wants me to have it, I'm gonna have it. I'm gonna tell you something. If you want something from God, listen, some of you need something in your marriage. Some of you need something with your children. Some of you need something in your future. Some of you need something for your job. Some of you need something for your home, your house, your finances, the dreams, the vision that's in the inside of you. You need God to come and touch you. You're gonna need that great faith. And can I tell you something? If you hold back, you're gonna lose and you won't make it. First thing you see this woman doing, she's coming to him. Isn't it great that she has access to him? How much more access do we have? She comes to him and she cries out. Cries out. I remember when I had back surgery and the doctor said, took x-rays, said, well, it failed and I'm dying. I mean, I'm literally, literally thinking I'm dying. The medicine for the pain is making me sick. It didn't work at all. I felt like I had the worst flu in the whole world. I, I couldn't sleep at night. Uh, Deborah would come in in the morning and I'd be sitting in a chair with my head between my legs. That's how I slept for three months with my head between my legs. I thought I was dying. Doctor says, I can't do any more for you. Christian doctor, he said, we'll pray for you. Got you on our prayer list. Said, Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Went, and I cried out to God. After months, I said, God, I said, I can't put up with this any longer. I can't breathe. I can't eat. I can't, I can't move. I can't walk. I can't talk. I can't do anything. I can't sleep. I can't even take a pain pill, God. I can't even take a pill to go to sleep. I, there's nothing works. I can't stay straight. I can't do anything. God, my goodness, God, only you, Lord, only you, Lord. And I cried out. And I want to tell you something. The beginning of great faith is when people are not afraid to cry out their passions to God. Let me tell you something. And can I say something? A wimpy little expression gets a wimpy answer. But someone who cries out, God, I've got to have this. I've got to have it. She cries out. The second thing we see is she starts to identify who he is, which blows me away. She rings his bell. She said who he is and what he does. In other words, she claims who he is. She says, have mercy on me. He's talking all the time about mercy. He's the God of mercy. Mercy is the opposite of selfishness. He's not a selfish, self-centered God, egotistical in his own ways, caring only about himself. Everything he says is not about for him. It's about for you and I. It's not so he can be a better God, bigger God. Does he need someone to worship him? Come on, be serious. He tells us if we'll get into him, we'll get blessed. That's what this is all about. He is the creator of life. We're not. And he identifies, she identifies, oh, have mercy on me. In other words, I'm gonna ring your bell. This is what you do the best. This is who you take care of as these kind of people. He says, and then he says, she says, oh Lord. And then you see the word son of David. In other words, she just recognized his bloodline that goes all the way back to David, which is calling him the Messiah. Shh. She recognized who it was. And she says this, and number three to look at this verse 22, is third point in just this one verse 22, which is fascinating. My daughter is severely demon possessed. She clearly identifies the problem. So many times we'll go to God, we won't clearly identify anything. We'll just say, God, heal me. Not heal me of what? Not heal me of when? Not heal me how. Oh God, bless me. Not 
Bless you financially, bless you in your marriage, bless you with your children. She clearly identifies. Now she could have gone to Jesus, wouldn't you think? And said, Jesus, my daughter's nuts. She's just losing her mind and she's making everybody crazy around her. Can you straighten out her mind? She recognized immediately that her daughter had a problem and the problem Jesus could identify was demon possessed. So many times we fail to clearly describe the problem we want faith to work on. And we just use these blanket blessings. God, I need you to bless me. Well, how do you want me to bless you? Where do you want me to bless you? What kind of blessings are you looking for? You're looking for blessings with your family, looking for blessings on the job, looking for blessings in the material things, looking for blessings in anointing, looking for a presence of God. What kind of blessings are you looking for? And oftentimes, because we are so lazy in describing exactly what it is that we have a passion for, that God doesn't do anything until we get to the place where we have a passion for what it is we're describing to God. And I think all of us need to clearly, precisely make it, this is what I'm talking to you about, God. This is what I expect to see. This is what I expect to do. This is what I expect to have. This is what I expect, this is what I want. This is what I believe you would have for me. And you described it clearly, just like she did. Her daughter was demon possessed. She could have said anything, but she didn't in verse 22. She clearly described, she had to be getting his attention right now. She had to be getting an awakening from him right now. Which brings us to verse number 23, which is also fascinating. Verse number 23, let me read it to you. But he answered her, not a word. I'm so sorry you guys missed the highlight on the word not. I know I did that because I put the word not in highlighted to my friends in the, in the back area. It's on the big one. Good. He answered her not a word. Can I just say something? Have you ever talked to somebody and they just stare at you? <laughs> it's like, or you're making a passion. How would you like to come up to somebody and cry out to them and they don't even acknowledge you? Maybe they don't even look at you. Maybe they, you know, come on. He answers her, not a word. In my life, if I don't have an answer from God, I am such a baby, I just want to quit. And this woman shows us a principle, and it's a great principle, of ignoring rejection. She's rejected by what he did. Either he stared at her or looked away or paid no attention, but he didn't even answer her cry. And in order for her to have great faith, she had to do something that most of us don't do. We do not ignore Rejection. We feel it. We react to it. We get bummed out over it. We complain about it. We don't like it. And for many of us, we stop in our faith because we've been rejected. Now stop, think about it. So most of the time, we're just rejected by people. How'd you like to be rejected by God? And this is a case where you won't find that in your life but it's showing the extreme here in her life that if God rejected her by not talking to her at all, how much more is God not gonna reject you but accept you? And if she can look away, she can ignore the rejection of God, oh my goodness, how much more can we ignore the rejection of people or things or negative stuff that comes at us all the time saying you won't get it, it isn't gonna happen. It's all, let me tell you something, when you got great faith, you look past everything that rejects your premise. Do we find this is an amazing thing? But not only is she rejected by God, listen to this. 
in verse number 23 again. His disciples come to him and urge him saying, send her away for she cries out after us. Send her away for she cries out after us. These are the disciples of Jesus Christ. These are the ones that walk with him and talk with him and sleep with them. They're the ones that are gonna carry his apostolic ministry all over the world. These are anointed men and they have judged her and said, tell her to get out, get away, she's bugging us. Man, she had to literally ignore all kinds of rejection, not only from man, but even in this particular case from God, it would appear. Let's talk for just a moment. Why did Jesus do that? Does Jesus not love her? Yes. Did Jesus not die for all mankind? Yes. On that cross, wasn't it after the cross that the evangelistic arm went out to the Gentiles, which you are part of most likely? The answer to that is yes. Then why would Jesus ignore this human soul coming after him? Because if he didn't do it, Israel would have never listened to him as the Messiah. Because Israel was so staunch in their religion of not having anything to do with anybody outside of uh, Judaism. If you had anything to do with them, you were yourself, you were unclean. And if Jesus came back and ministered to her, then all of the people in Israel would have judged him as a, as a bad person who broke the law of ministering to a, a woman. So his first assignment is to the Jewish nation to Israel is second assignment after the cross is to ladies like her and you and me. Because without that, Israel would have been lost. And as you know, Israel won't be lost. Are you listening to the wisdom of God here? And sometimes we look at this and we say, man, he's mean, how could he do that? He knew exactly what he was doing in order for the gospel to reach not only the Gentiles, but also the Jewish Israel nation. Come on, somebody. So important for you to know this because in other words, you'll judge Jesus as a prejudiced person and he's not at all. He's just a wise person. Is anybody listening? So in verse number 23, she had to ignore rejection. Verse number 24, let's read it. And it says, and he answered and said, now when he, it says this, look, look at these words. But he answered and said, I always thought he was saying this to her. He's not. He hadn't said a word to her. He's talking to his disciples. And he answered, why? Who said what? Oh, turn her away from us. Get her away from us. She comes after us. She's bothering, bugging us. And he answers them is what he's talking to. He answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That, that right there is everything that I just said to you. He knew what he was doing. He wanted his guys to recognize that he is not talking to her, but that he is sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Wow. And so here we find in verse number 24, which is so fascinating, you have to, and let's go to verse 25 to fully understand this. Then she came and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Sometimes you're going to have to ignore logic because it was logical that he was not to go to that woman, the only to Israel, and, but she proceeds, everything goes after him. And when she goes after him, she is saying, I'm ignoring not only your rejection, I am no, I'm ignoring the obvious. I'm ignoring everything that you have to say about this. I, I'm ignoring, if you will, these words that says the logical thing for him to do is this. He, her faith is gonna go back beyond human logic. 
Now you gotta get this. If you don't get this, you're gonna understand anything. Great faith goes beyond human logic. Human logic is two plus two makes four. Great faith says two plus two is whatever God says he wants it to be. Are you following me? And great faith, so here he is explaining to his disciples these words. I can't go, my, my call is the lost sheep of Israel. He doesn't talk to her at all. And now we see something else takes place. But he answered and said, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, verse number 25, watch this. And she came, she worshiped him, and she says, Lord, help me. Now she got an audience with him. Didn't have it first, now she's got an audience with him. Great faith had to get past the logic of what he even said. Get past the rejection of what people say. Great faith now comes to a place that is determined to be persistent. Great faith doesn't give up when people give you negative junk. Everybody told us we'll never build this church. It'll never be anything. San Bernardino has had 40 years of pastor's failures. You'll never build this church. You'll never build this sanctuary. You don't have the money. You don't have the resources. People in San Bernardino, 48% of them are on social welfare. Where are you going to get the money to build this place? I mean, you'll have to get past and reject the logic that comes at you because you have such a passion on the inside. And that passion on the inside has got to be like this woman. She's heard it all now. She saw that he ignored her. She saw that he didn't pay any attention to her. She saw, heard what the men said about her. He, she heard even the excuse that he said to his men that was logical. She understood that. She looked past all of that and she comes and she does something. She worships him and cries out, Lord, help me. I mean, sometimes when we're not heard by God or we feel like our prayers haven't gone anywhere, has anybody ever prayed and you feel like God's not listening? Come on, be honest with me. Let me ask a question again. Has anybody ever prayed and you feel like God is not even listening to you? Come on, all of us. Guess what? <clears throat> she didn't let that stop her. She ignored all the obvious stuff. And now she comes in a place and she does something. She doesn't complain to him. I mean, I would have come to him and said, what's wrong with you? You prejudice about me? I thought you're supposed to love people. You talk about love. You talk about mercy. You talk about grace. You talk about healing those that are broken. You talk about all these things. What's wrong with you? You must be a phony. You must be a liar. You must be a cheater. That's what people do. She does it. She cuts past all of that and worships him and then cries out again, Lord, help me. Sometimes the best prayer you'll ever have is just simply, God, help me. Just simple as that. Help me, God. Who's your helper? Well, I tell you what, that's him. So we see this great faith starting to take place. It's amazing. But in verse number 26, is what I found really fascinating. In verse 26, he says, but he answered and said, now he's going to talk to her. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. <laughs> You're going to have to ignore insults. Because the devil will insult you at every turn of the road. You're too stupid. You can't make it. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't believe in you. You'll never, there'll be every insult before you ever get anything that you need. Listen to me. You're going to have to learn how to not only ignore those other problems, but ignore insults. Insults will come. And sometimes that's the last straw for most people. They just fall apart. Because here's the insult. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. Insult is here, he's just called her a little dog. My goodness, Jesus. The king of glory, the one who loves people that goes to the cross and dies for the sins of all mankind has now just called this Canaan woman a little dog. Surely she's going to give up. The reason she doesn't give up, and this is in the Bible, so that you would understand that you don't have to give up on what it is you're believing God for also. 
That's why it's here. She has been insulted, not just from her friends or relatives or family. You know, you go home and you say, I really love Jesus, your mom or your dad or your relatives, your wife or whatever. You kidding me? Go ahead, I'm out of here. You're crazy. And you get insults and man, it just shakes you up. She's insulted, he's calling her a little dog. But she has this amazing response and verse number 27 that I thought was fabulous. And verse number 27, let me read it to you. And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Let me hear, give you this point. Never give up. She wasn't about to give up. Even the little dogs get the crumbs, which is a true statement. Even the little dogs get the crumbs. It's a true statement. And she was doing something. She was saying, I am not giving up no matter what anybody says, no matter if you assault me, no matter if you uh, reject me, no matter if you tell me logical things, I am not giving up, I'm not backing down, I'm going for God, I'm gonna get results, and the results are gonna come. And a lot of times we don't realize that. I just wanna give you a verse, if I may. In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses, I guess, 12, 13, if you, 13, 14, maybe. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, let me say that again. Having done all to stand, one more time. Having done everything you can to stand, the next word, next word is really important. Verse Stand. After you've done everything you know how to do to stand, keep on standing. And that's what she did. She worshiped, she asked, she shouted, she cried. She was insulted. She was told logical things to get her off. You will be told everything you can that you can't do it. It won't do it. Doesn't make sense. God doesn't care whatsoever. I'm here to tell you something. God put that in the Bible so you and I would know that if she could do this with Jesus, how much more can we do with Jesus on our side? <clears throat> Never give up. Here's the point for tonight. We learned some things and I thought I'd like to just share them with you if I may. You know, the Bible says if you're gonna come boldly to the throne of grace, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 16, it says, let us therefore come boldly. Did she not come boldly? Yes. Now watch this. To the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, God. Did she not get her mercy? <laughs> Watch this. And find grace. Help me, God. She got her help. In a time of need, you and I have to share with God it's a time of need and be passionate enough to keep on keeping on until we see some results or until you decide enough is enough. Let me let you out of this a little bit. My mom was dying. She died a couple of years ago. She was 96 years old. <clears throat> She'd been sick most of her life, really healthy, healthy, healthy woman. I mean, the woman could tell me the vitamin content of that pulpit. She was, she told me nuts always eating health food and everything. It just drives me nuts. She was 96 years old. But the last year of her life, she got really sick. So bad that it, was, it wasn't good. It's one of those things. And I'd been praying for her and praying for her. And I know how to stand and keep on standing. But I said, Lord, she'd be better off with you than with me. And I let go of my prayer, and she went on to be with Jesus. My point being this, this that you use great faith for 
is something that you are absolutely not going to ever back off of. And you'll get results. But you also need to know if there's a time coming when you say enough is enough, that's okay to have that and say, Lord, I surrender this to you. Because why? Our job is not just to have great faith to get what we want. Our job is to get what he wants. And that's where faith comes in. So we need to know that all the way around, you can get great faith going like she did with those points that we talked about, we'll talk about it again, and get results. But you can also have the freedom to have his results in that situation in your life and move on and go past it. You are at liberty to do whatever you need. And that in itself is great faith. Here's the things that we've learned. Number one, come boldly. She did. Number two, when you come into the house of God, the Bible says that you enter his courts with praise, which really in this case, she claimed who he is. You are the son of David. Lord, be merciful to me. The third thing she did is she clearly recognized the problem and defined it to Jesus, which you and I need to do better. The fourth thing that she did is she ignored rejection and logic and insults that come when you're standing in faith. The fifth thing she did is she was determined to be persistent. I'm not giving up my dream of my daughter being set free. And number six, she made a statement. I'm never giving up. I'll take the crumbs. That's better than nothing. So something from God is better than nothing that the world has to offer. And so tonight, I hope you got something out of those few verses. And if you did, give him the praise. Will you do that? All that we talked about leads to great faith. Sometimes we forget those. Most of you already know that. But great faith is what really caught the attention of Jesus, who was paying no attention to her. So when you feel like he's paying no attention to you, my question is, where's your faith? No other way to please God but by faith. He that comes to God must believe, Hebrews the sixth chapter, 11 chapter, verse six, must believe that he is God. And then it goes on to say, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently, what? Seek him. Great faith. It pleases God and catches his attention. Come on, give the Lord one more great big praise. Will you that? <clears throat> Tonight, I just want to make sure that everybody's all right with God, and then I'm going to let you go. This is a fun Bible study, huh? Is that okay? The chapter gets better. Anyway, fun Bible study. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God. You know, I said something earlier, and I don't know if you caught it or not. I said, there's two things that are eternal in the kingdom of God. The word of God is eternal, only two things. The second thing is the soul of man. Yep, it's eternal. Which means you're going to spend eternity somewhere. <laughs> You'll either spend it with God Or you'll hear these words, go for me a worker of iniquity, I know you not. And you'll spend it in hell, lost from God. It's your call. The beauty of all of this is that Jesus loves you and me so much that he goes to the cross and he dies sacrificing himself so that you and I could have eternal life. 
But it doesn't just come to you because he did that. It comes to you because you accept that. And when you accept that, that means he becomes your Lord and Savior, which means he is now the boss of your life. A lot of people don't know that. They think they just pray a little prayer, you know, with Billy Graham on television or Harvest Crusade, and repeat a certain formula of a prayer. Now think about this. And sometimes we treat God so stupid, we think he is so dumb that he hears a formula of prayer and he says, oh, they hit all the right highlights. They said all the right things. I guess I'll let them in heaven. No magical abracadabra words can get you into heaven. No, no. Listen to what I'm saying to you. No preacher walking by you throwing smoke and incense all over you get you to heaven. You can go to seminary school all of your life, sit there, become a professor at seminary school, die and end up eternally in hell because you didn't do what God said to do. Jesus makes it very clear if you're going to go to heaven, John the third chapter, you must, I'm going to say that again, you must, I got to say it one more time, you must be born again. And all over the world, when I use the word born again, everybody turns off. You know why they turn off? Because Hollywood made born again people look like idiots in their movies and magazines and their books and stories. Radical, fanatical goofballs. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again doesn't mean that you're crazy or goofy. It means that you've surrendered all of your heart, listen to this, and you've surrendered all of your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're not born again until you do. You can be raised in a denomination like I was. Do all the stuff they tell you to do, die and go to hell, because it's not about whether you do all the stuff, it's whether or not your heart is right with God. This is all about the heart, my friends. This is all about the heart. And you have a free will choice to give him all of your heart or to give him all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, I'll say it again. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. I'll prove it to you, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What did he just say? Lukewarm people are going to get rejected from the body of Christ. And they're going to live out eternity, not in Christ, somewhere else. And you don't want that. But it's your call. And all you have to do is say, I believe in that cross. I believe in Jesus. I believe in his resurrection. But now, I, because I believe, I want to respond by giving him all of my heart and giving him all of my life. Without that, you're not born again. Because listen to this, lukewarm people are not going to make it. So let me define for you lukewarm. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know what I mean. You're not against God. No, no, you're not against God. But you're not wholehearted for God. Listen to what I just said. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. And you'll get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes. And you don't want that. And you're going to live somewhere for eternity. <laughs> and it's your call. And the question tonight, here you are in this safe and friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs. You were great listening to the Bible, the word of God tonight. You're in this safe place tonight. Tonight, 
If you haven't given Jesus all of your heart and you haven't given Jesus all of your life and made a commitment of all to him, then you're not saved and you're not going to make it. And tonight you have the free will choice of making that call for yourself in this safe and friendly place. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer with people who want to receive Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And if you want to be included in that prayer, I'm going to ask you in a minute to raise your hand and then put it right back down. And when I see your hand go up, I'll count you and then you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be born again. And I'll see it. Because Jesus said, if you confess me, watch this, before men, I'll confess you as mine before the Lord, Father God. And you need to make that public statement for Jesus. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm talking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm talking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, you gotta give it to him, he's not a thief. He won't rob it from you, it's your life. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, my goodness, don't leave this place the same. Make sure, it's okay. I won't embarrass you. But you need to make a public statement by at least getting your hand up for Jesus and then praying that prayer with me. I wanna pray for you tonight, but I don't know who wants me to pray for them. So I'm gonna ask every one of you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. There's no looking around. Some of you still got your eyes open or looking at me, stop it. Close your eyes, come on. Bow your heads. I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna pop my hands together. All of you that say, pray for me, I wanna go to heaven, I don't wanna go to hell. No one's looking, just you and me. When you raise your hand, you can look up at me so I can tell you that I saw you. And I'm gonna clap, pop my hands together. You get your hand up all over this auditorium, even back in the family rooms, wherever you're at. And then you put your hand right back down. And what you're saying is, Pastor, I want you to include me in that prayer. I wanna go to heaven. I don't wanna go to hell. Wow. And I'll see it. You can put your hand right back down. All across this auditorium, get ready. I'm counting to three right now. If you've never given him all of your heart and life, this is your time. I know you know who he is in your head. Even the devil knows who he is. But that won't get you to heaven, having head knowledge of who Jesus is. It's about your heart. Giving him all of your heart and giving him all of your life. Are you ready? All across this auditorium. Are you ready? One. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. Thank you. There's three. There's four. There's five. Thank you. There's six back there. There's seven back there. There's eight back over there. Come on. In this section, I didn't see anybody here. Eight, nine. Thank you. There's 10. There's 11 right here. Come on. There's 12 right over here. Put your hand down. You see it. There's 12. There's 13. Thank you. There's 14. Anybody else? Back here, there's 14. There's, there's over here, there's 15. There's one, right? 15, God bless you, 150. Anybody else, where are you? 16, 17, 18. Anybody else that needs to get their hand up? Nobody's looking. I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Anybody else, real quick? 16, 17, 18, you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? There's another one somewhere, you're pointing over here. I got you, good. What was it? That was 16, good. Is there a 17? Is there a 17? Needs to get your hand up. Well, thank God, thank God, thank God for 17. Give the Lord a great big praise. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, your purse, sweater, Bible, friend, if you need a friend, your neighbor. Say, come on, go with me if, you're, if you raise your hand. Everybody that raised your hand, you're serious about God. Listen, she came after Jesus. You're going to have to not sit there, think that prayer is going to get you to heaven. You're going to have to extend yourself, get out of your seat, get your stuff, 
Bring a friend if you need to drag them. Check with your neighbor and say, come on, I'll go with you. If you didn't raise your hand, but it's not too late, you can come. And I'm gonna pray with these people that are in front. So all of you that are here, I won't embarrass you, but if you raise your hand and you're serious about God, get out of your seat right now and meet me right here in front. Let's welcome them as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on. takes you to get into heaven. What I mean by that is you're gonna tell a lot of your friends are gonna say you're an idiot, you're a fool, that's the stupidest thing in the world, it doesn't work, I tried it once, it doesn't work, relatives, family, all that stuff. Don't listen to anybody. Remember how I said this? Ignore rejection. Even ignore logic. And I don't know how this works, it just does. And I'm telling you, God's gonna do something great. And remember this, never give up on God. Even though maybe your prayers aren't instantly answered. How many of you down there in, uh, uh, never had prayers that have been instantly answered? Anybody? We all have not had prayers instantly answered. We don't give up. We keep fighting for this relationship with God. You're gonna be saved. You're gonna be in the heaven uh, w when you die. But in the meantime, while you're living here on this planet, God wants to do great things in your life, in your future, in your family, in your, in, in your destiny and purpose. That's what God's all about. He takes all of us losers. How many losers have there been out there before you got God? Just give me a shout. Church full of losers. And listen, and guess what? Your home, we're all there. And then he takes us losers and makes us winners. But it doesn't happen staying at home. It doesn't happen sitting at home. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. He's going to pray with you. This guy's name is Pastor Joe L. Easy to remember. Pastor Joe with an L on the end. His last name is real easy to remember. It's avocado. <laughs> and his two kids are called guaca and moly. I mean, it's simple. Sorry. Sorry. I, I like to play with him. That's all. I like to tease him. So anyway, I just want you to know it's friendly, no weird stuff goes on. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, give you some free stuff, introduce you to a program we have that'll help you get strong. Make a left turn, follow Joel right over there. Come on, let's do that. Give the Lord a great big praise. 